Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord as we celebrate and worship together today. We're excited for this opportunity and also to uh, just remind you that every Thursday night at 6.30, the choir is rehearsing, getting ready uh, for uh, many of our music specials. And uh, also, uh, if you'll let Alan or Todd know if you have interest, I know uh, some of you are kind of coming back in and interested in reconnecting, so you'll want to let him know, or both of them. And we also uh, are preparing for our 120th anniversary. That's November 12th at 10 a.m. The bishop will be here and also many of our former pastors, staff. We've already been hearing uh, Mark Caldwell uh, just uh, two days ago. Christy Castillo uh, told me her whole family will be here. So you'll want to see her new baby girl. She just had a little girl in March, so we're excited for them to join with us. Let us prepare our hearts for worship as we stand now for opening hymn. our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated if you'll take time to wave to one another and say hello and make sure you wave up in the balcony too our youngest one up here miss ellie up there <laughs> good to see everyone good to have everyone with us 
We're excited at this moment to share a little one of our history moments as David Crankshaw from our history team comes and joins with us. Good morning, church family. I'm David Crankshaw, and I'm on the history committee, not because I know the history, but because I wanted to learn. And I have a wonderful teacher, Jean Reedy, our church historian. For example, our church building is over 100 years old, and the Methodist organization here in this county is 120 years old, but we have a much older item at the top of the steeple out front, the church bell. <clears throat> From the notes of uh, Reverend John Hanger, who was pastor in the 1940s, this one was dated January 26, 1945. He wrote that the church bell has a long and interesting history and it was installed during the Christmas season of 1944. It is supposed to have been originally cast in England about 1783 and shipped to the Mississippi uh, to Mississippi for installation in a uh, plantation bell in the Shipland Plantation, which is a 10,000 acre site along the Mississippi River. According to the inscription on the bell itself, it was recast in this country in 1849. Thus, the bell was uh, in part of three centuries used as a plantation bell. Now, during the 1940s, the government purchased the larger portion of the Shipland Plantation for subdivision into smaller lots. Thus, the uh, bell had no pur further purpose or necessity at the plantation. And through the efforts of Rev uh, Mr. Norman McEwen of Park Temple, we were called Park Temple in the 40s, and a nephew of the owner of the plantation, the bell was given to the church and shipped to Fort Lauderdale. The bell weighs about 800 pounds and has an excellent tone. It was run regularly for church services and other occasions. I'm gonna tell you about one. I found an interesting comment regarding the, the bell after it had first arrived here in Fort Lauderdale. Early on the day of May 8th, 1945, World War II came to an end, known as VE Day. Mr. R. L. Landers of Park Temple uh, was then stationed at the U.S. Coast Guard Station at Port Everglades. Two years later, he would marry Helen Harriet, who was our church historian in her later years. Mr. Landers states regarding VE Day, and I quote, Lewis Kind, a junior, a junior at Fort Lauderdale High School, and Joe Sears, church historian, and John Hanger, senior pastor, and I met at the church, and we hand rung the bell for a long, long time. People heard the bell, and they entered the church for prayer. We did the same thing in early August when it, the war came to an end with Japan. One great service was held at 5 p.m. Uh, for the community thanking God that the war had ended, end quote. The bell reminds me of these things whenever I hear it, and I hope it will give you extra blessing now when you hear it. And also remember to keep November 12th open on your calendar for our 120th birthday party of the Methodist. Thank you very much.
Before I offer the scripture, I did want to acknowledge that these beautiful flowers today are from Becky Norwood in remembrance of her brother Jimmy. And so we remember her family this time. Our first scripture comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 26. Hear now the word of God. Now a man named Lazarus was sick, and he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus was laying sick, was the same who poured the perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews were trying to stone you, and yet you're going to go back? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they will see by the world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought he meant a natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe but let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise at the last and the resurrection the last day. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into this world. And then from 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy, he has given us a new birth in a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And finally, from John's book of Revelation, Chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sin by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and our Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. 
O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your presence. May my words become your message for each of us, your people. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we continue our sermon series based on the Gospel of John, we encounter both the prophecy and the promise of resurrection coming to fulfillment. Now, the resurrection is not only a fundamental part of our Christian faith or the Gospels or the good news, it is literally the glue holding everything together. Paul once said, without the resurrection, we preach in vain and we live without hope. Christ proclaimed and promised resurrection as he drew closer to the cross. Resurrection offers us a hope of forgiveness, a hope of reconciliation and peace with God, and a hope of eternal life. According to Romans 6.4, just as Christ was raised from death, through the glory of our Father, we too may live a new life now and forever. This resurrection power turns a mess into a message, a setback into a comeback, an obstacle into an opportunity. Resurrection is a sign of God's power to transform to change, to liberate, to lift up, even in the darkest moments. You see, nothing is impossible with God. We can receive assurance and comfort and a spirit of resilience, which will enable us to recognize our purpose and our promise in this life. Now, in our scripture this morning, John 11 we see these friends in Bethany. We've seen them before. We, in fact, we see them three times in John's Gospel. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They mention that Mary had anointed Jesus' feet with oil, spilling out, really, her hope chest. You see, in that time, that kind of nard or that kind of perfume could raise a lot of money for a dowry, but she remained single. In the first exchange we see in John 10, Jesus and the disciples have found support and hospitality in this home in Bethany, only two miles from Jerusalem. You see the disciples a bit anxious because they remember the closer you get to Jerusalem, the closer Jesus gets to the threats on his life. So going back there is not just about a miracle for Lazarus, it's about the cross looming large. You see, Bethany is at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Bethany actually means the house of the poor. We may say, well, were Mary and Martha and Lazarus poor? They were perhaps not poor, but they were people eager to serve and to be there for Christ. We learn in one exchange that Martha shows Jesus honor by serving good meals and providing lodging for the disciples, but she is also bossy and critical especially of her sister Mary. You remember that story. Lord, aren't you going to tell her to help me? You know, I've been so busy all day getting this food ready for this whole entourage, and she's been sitting there listening to you talk. But remember what Jesus said? Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are so distracted. Mary has chosen the better portion. And what is that? To listen and to be close to our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that he was saying it's bad to get excited and anxious about serving meals to people, but he is saying take time to be close, especially 
when the presence of God is so accessible to you. Now, once more, we see them, again, mentioned in John 11. Martha is upset with Jesus for his delay. Did you notice that? When Jesus is first encountered by these sisters, Martha is the one who said, if you'd only been here, this wouldn't have happened. Have you ever heard that? Has someone ever said that to you? If you'd only come sooner, you know, that boss that says, your timing is not so good. She's saying that to God. You didn't show up. You didn't do it fast enough. Have you ever said that to God? Your timing is terrible, God. If I were God, I wouldn't have done it this way. I would have done it sooner and faster and better. She is concerned. At the same time, she knows who he is. Did you know in the Bible there are only two times when people directly say to Jesus, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah? It's Martha and Peter, two bossy, obstinate people recognize who he was. Perhaps you, like Martha too, have in times in life said, Jesus, I love you, I trust you, I commit to you, but your timing stinks. Something isn't right. Can't you answer my prayers? in the way I want you to answer them. She knows he's the Messiah, but she doesn't quite understand what God is up to. We have so much to learn. Can you imagine this friend that you love? It says Jesus loved Lazarus so much that he waited. He loved him so much that he waited two days. Now you and I, if you call the pastor, you should be here now. Don't you dare wait two days, right? He's the rabbi, he's the teacher, he's the leader. Why does he wait? He begins to reveal to us that sometimes in the waiting, we can begin to comprehend that God is at work. It's not all about us. What did you do? You're the sister. You could have done more, right? What could you do? The brother, the friend. You didn't do it. What can God do? We actually can learn so much. Have you ever had that time when you did rush in and the timing was not right either? Perhaps you tried to rescue someone and they really needed time to sit in that moment. Maybe God was showing up to them in their brokenness and pain and you said, I'll take care of it. Don't you worry. Come here. Let's do this. Let's do this. Get it done. Check. I'm the Savior now. We have so much to learn. Sometimes we need to love someone so much that we don't rush in. We wait to see how is God using this? How is God going to play out this experience? You see, a miracle took place even though it did not fit Martha's timeline. A miracle took place. You know Dealing with death and sadness and grief is one of life's most difficult lessons. We pray for healing, and we may say to the world, God did not answer my prayer in the way I prayed. This is very disappointing. We prayed for this. I mean, I had people around the world praying for this. And he did not answer it in the way I wanted him to. I hear it all the time. I saw it just the other day. Martha is saying the same thing in this experience. She doesn't yet quite comprehend 
how God is going to use this time. Now, C.S. Lewis, a very amazing person, didn't get married till he was 40, and he was an agnostic, really, until he was about 40. So he gets married, he becomes a Christian, all this kind of thing in one, maybe two years, three years. He was a Christian before they got married, but about the same time period. And she got bone cancer, and her name was Joy. And he had to watch Joy suffer and die. And there's a beautiful book that he wrote called Surprised by Joy. He was surprised that he had joy with her, even though it seemed so brief and so fleeting. C.S. Lewis once said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. You see, we have a hope called heaven. Lazarus that day would be resuscitated and revived and resurrected, but he still had hope even on the day he died later. Jesus was an amazing carpenter on earth, but he is even a most magnificent builder and provider for our eternal home. Not that we're eager to leave this world, but you see, trusting in his resurrection power makes a difference in how we live here and now. It impacts our priorities. It lightens our load. It equips us with the tools to navigate life with principles and guidance and promise. You see, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. And how do we prepare? by living in his love with this unending hope in God's deliverance. Now, there are some comparisons to be made. They mentioned Thomas. Did you hear what he said? Thomas said, let's go with Jesus. Let's be prepared to die with him. Do you know how many times we only remember doubting Thomas? We only remember the doubts, the questions, don't we? You see, it pops up again in John 14 when Jesus said, Thomas, you know the way we're going, the way I'm going. All the disciples are there. You guys know where I'm going. We've been talking about it for a while now. And Thomas says, no, we don't, Lord. We do not understand. We don't get it. We really don't get it. It doesn't make sense to us. What are you trying to tell us? You see, where Martha questions God's timing and trusts his power, Thomas questions everything, almost as if to say, I know you reading today may have a lot of questions. It's okay. You see, God has room for all of us, whether you're a Martha or a Peter or a Thomas, whoever you are. You want to follow Jesus. You may not comprehend everything that he has taught. The Holy Spirit can help, but Jesus has room for all. Charles Spurgeon once said, little faith will bring your soul to heaven. Great faith will bring heaven to your soul. Walking around with heaven now. You see, there is a calm assurance that comes once we realize that God is for us and not against us. Jesus is the I am. Jesus declares by saying these seven I am's, I am the visible, tangible, touchable, reachable representation of God Almighty here with you. Do you know that how you view God will affect how you live? 
He is the resurrection and he is the life. If you perceive that God is a cruel judge or controlling tyrant, you will live a life of shame and insecurity. If you see God as a casual buddy just joining along, you will never take your sin seriously. You might live an indulgent life, a self-serving life. But if you can imagine Jesus is God in our midst, the embodiment of this resurrection power, you will live a life of calm assurance. Death need not be feared. Difficulties need not be seen as defining failure. If you can trust that God is good and God is for us and not against us, you will live life more intentionally and purposefully. You see, Jesus is trying to reveal himself every single day in us, through us, even in spite of us sometimes. God works in time and space, but is not limited to the same way we are limited. Jesus tells us, if you know me and you see me and you believe in me, it is the same thing as knowing and seeing and believing in the Father. If you are seeking answers to your life's questions, your meaning, your purpose, the answer is standing before you. At Bethlehem, God moved into our neighborhood, and at Calvary, God bore the burden of pain and shame and sin for the whole world. You see, sin wasn't just causing us harm. Sin was killing us. While the message of Jesus is presented once more, it comes as a contrast to the many voices and messages that are begging to be followed every single day. If you're on social media, you know, who are you following? Who are you following? Whose pictures are you following? What message are you following? And Jesus is out there, you know, are you following me? What are you listening to? What are you seeking? There's a movie, you've probably seen it, called A Few Good Men. A Few Good Men. There's a young lawyer with integrity, and he is interviewing an older officer who's become kind of disgruntled, but also very manipulative. He has made some unfortunate missteps that caused the death of one of these soldiers. The older officer, played by Jack Nicholson, says... What do you want? And the lawyer says, I want the truth. Now, it's, the story is that the script says, you already have the truth. But this is not what Jack Nicholson said. In full ca character and temperament and, you know, this disgruntled, angry, older gentleman, he says, you can't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth. It became a very famous line. Now there are voices begging us to follow the same thing. You can't handle the truth. You won't survive in the real world without being self-centered and cunning and manipulative. You're so naive. Now Jesus exclaimed, I beg to differ. One generation says to another, you can't handle this. Jesus says, I beg to differ. They surely can handle it because I am the truth. You see, resurrection power enabled a young student in China to stand in front of tanks the day my eldest son was born. That's resurrection power. Have no fear. 
resurrection power enabled someone like Martin Luther King Jr. to challenge the injustice of racial inequality, we shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe longs, is long, but it bends toward justice. Resurrection power enabled Archbishop Oscar Romero to stand up to a corrupt system of violence and harassment. He said, God is not satisfied with our appearances. God wants the garments of justice. God wants his Christians dressed in love. Just before he was killed, serving Holy Communion by someone in the military and his own government, he said, those who wish to harm us may kill me, but I will rise up again in my people. When Jesus says he is the resurrection and the life, he gives us courage. Courage to speak truth. He gives us the godly perspective of life. You see, Martha believed that the resurrection was an event in the future, and Jesus says, I am the resurrection. It is present. It is here. It is now. Martha's knowledge of the eternal life was sort of an abstract idea, just like yours is. It's some abstract idea that, oh, after we die, we do this, and this happens. And Jesus says, it's not an idea. It's a personal relationship with me that changes life now. Martha thought victory over death was something to expect long and far away. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection. This is present. Jesus asked Martha what he asked all of us, do you believe this? May we all answer in the same way she did. Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into this world. Even when it looks like a person has life by the tail, they may need this resurrection power, this re reassurance. Several years ago, a rising star athlete played both professional football and baseball. And everyone thought, this guy has everything and anything. And he had a wife and two children and deals coming in, going like crazy. But his wife said, I'm done. I'm taking the children and I'm done with you. He had gotten a little too big for his own britches. His head was so big with this ego. And she said, I'm done. And she left. And he said, when she left, Everything he thought that was so successful about his life was crushing him and pulling him under. He wrote it in How Success Almost Ruined My Life. Although he seemed golden, he remembered his childhood as a single boy growing up in Fort Myers, and he didn't want that life for his kids. But he felt like a failure. He said, I considered taking my car, my fancy car, and just heading off a cliff. And then I realized they'd have no father, even if it was a distant father. And then he remembered, I have a father, a father in heaven. Now, you may not like his technique, but Dion Sanders was this comeback kid who said, without God, without his power to restore me, the rest of my life wouldn't have happened. Now, some of us were watching that late night football game last night, Colorado, and his two younger sons, he did marry again. He had family, all his children. And now he's working with Colorado college football, and he realized, without that resurrection power, I would have ended my life. 
without remembering who loves me, who sees me, without the medals, without the trophies, and doesn't give up. What could resurrection power look like in your life? What has it already done to help you, to work with you, to overcome? To all the voices pushing and pulling in every direction, quiet. Listen to this voice. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our song of reflection, when the roll is called up yonder. Let us turn now to God in prayer. The Lord most holy and gracious, the resurrection and the life, may your truth open our hearts, our eyes, our minds, our lives to follow you, to recognize that you come into our lives and you transform our life where there is a message waiting to be shared, we once saw a mess we could not understand. Lord, when those obstacles loom large before us, we understand now that they are opportunities for you to reveal your promise and your power. O oh Lord, enable us to be those people of faith the ones who follow Jesus, the ones who listen to his voice, the ones he calls by name. O oh God, we draw near. We draw close to hear your voice. And we offer our prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand together for our closing hymn, He Lives. you to join us in the parlor for refreshments after the service. It'll be so nice to see you and meet with you. We also invite you during the week we have Bible studies and wonderful opportunities to get to know each other even better. Let us receive God's blessing and benediction. The Lord bless you with the assurance and the calm of his peace. May his presence remind you that the resurrection power will enable you to overcome. Receive the blessing. Be the blessing. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Amen.